Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have Tobias Schneider, an assistant professor from the School of Engineering at EPFL, who is giving us a talk on uh, patterns in turbulence to the buckling of shells, the role of unstable invariant solutions in nonlinear mechanics. And we have um, on the panel today uh, from LMS, we have Nicolas Trianta Filidis, Basilo Doli, Julie Diani, and from uh, LADIX, we have Patrick Huer and Christophe Josseron who have joined us to kick, kick off some discussions and then we will see how it goes from there. So Tobias, please begin. Perfect, thanks a lot. So thanks for the invitation. And um, yeah, so first of all, this is of course not only my work, this is my work plus of course a whole team involved in there, my direct team and a lot of collaborators. Some of them will be mentioned Others will not, but um, without a lot of people, that would have not been possible. Okay, so I'm heading this um, Emergent Complexity in Physical Systems lab, and that means uh, we're interested in phenomena like these laminar turbulent patterns in shear flows. Um, other examples are intricate 3D shapes, which are not biological, but they are formed by an inorganic chemical reaction. And what you see here, looks like the flagellum of a bacterium, but it's actually just an elastic filament which uh, extends active tangential, tangential forces on a viscous fluid. So these complex patterns, shapes, and dynamics emerge in systems which are simple. They are simple in the sense that we exactly know the underlying physics. So um, this one here is just the flow of water between two walls, so it's Navier-Stokes dynamics. Here, you have a chemical reaction that drives crystal growth. And uh, this is a physical mimic of biology, but it just combines viscous fluid dynamics and active elasticity. So what we want is, we want to understand the physical mechanism underlying these complex patterns, shapes, and dynamics. And the difficulty is, although we know the physics, that they are all described by highly nonlinear differential equations. So you have to understand what these differential equations do. And our approach is, um, a dynamical systems approach based on underlying uh, so-called invariant solutions of these equations. And I'm trying, despite uh, only having 45 minutes, I'm trying to explain this with two examples. One is a fluids example, the second one is an elasticity example. Okay, so the fluids example. Um, I will talk about patterns in convection, but the motivation actually comes from shear flows. So you all know if you take a simple shear flow like plane grad flow flow between two parallel plates, you increase the plate velocity, the laminar flow remains linearly stable. So you shouldn't have turbulence in there. However, if you perturb the flow, so you stick your finger into the domain, then the system phase separates and you get a turbulent phase surrounded by a laminar phase. And if you wait a little bit longer, amazing things happen. So this turbulent flow may self-organize into regular um, stripe patterns. And although we, we as the community, I think have made great progress recently in understanding a little bit about these stripes, I think it's fair to say still that they are highly challenging to understand. But that's what we would like to do at some point. Now, in shear flows, patterns are hard to understand. But we all know a fluid system where pattern formation is much better understood and that is convection, so Rayleigh-Barnard convection. So you have a fluid between a bottom plate, which is, uh, is heated, and a cold top plate. Um, in there, you'll have as a base state, no flow and just uh, a, lin a linear temperature profile, so um, the conduction state. But if you increase the temperature difference enough, this state becomes linearly unstable and you get convection rolls, where hot fluid is moved from the bottom plate to the top, cold fluid comes from the top to the bottom, and thereby you increase the heat transport. So that's a long story problem. We now want a system where we can combine shear and buoyancy that drives instabilities in convection. So what we do is we take the Rayleigh Lenard cell and simply incline it against gravity. If we do that, what happens? Well, hot fluid comes uh, flowing up um, the bottom hot plate, cold fluid down the cold wall, and sets up a cubic shear profile. So now you have a system where you have buoyancy and shear that can both drive instabilities. So the system has three control parameters. 
There's of course the angle of inclination. There is the driving, so the Rayleigh number, which is just a non-dimensional uh, version of the temperature difference. And we have a material property, the Prandtl number, which is the ratio of viscosity and thermal diffusivity. So the question is, what are patterns when buoyancy and shear compete? And that has been studied in detail uh, experimentally by uh, Karen Daniels and Ebert Bodenschatz based on experiments in compressed CO2 gas at more than 40 bars pressure. Um, so uh, this is a fixed Prandtl number there. And I show you simply a phase diagram where on one axis you have a measure of the thermal driving, here you have the inclination angle, and you see tons of different patterns that emerge. Um, here's an example. We're looking at it from the top, um, where you have a semi-regular background, and on this background you have these bursting events which are localized in space and localized in time. So the obvious question now is, can we understand the mechanisms underlying these patterns? And now we have the advantage that we went from shear flows to convection, because the first thing that we can do is we can now search for linear instabilities of the base state. The system actually has two uh, linear instabilities of the base state. And what I'm showing you here is the neutral curve. So I'm showing you for, of course, a fixed frontal number. I'm showing you the critical Rayleigh number as a function of the inclination angle, where the base state becomes unstable. And for small angles of inclination here, the dashed curve, the first instability are longitudinal convection rolls. So these are the rolls that we all know from Rayleigh Binar convection. It's just that they now have a preferred orientation. So you're breaking isotropy in the plane, and they are now aligned with the incline. So we call them the longitudinal rolls. At higher angles of inclination, we have a lot of shear in the system. And there, the primary instability is towards transverse rolls, which you should think of an analog to tolman schlichting waves. So these are overturning motions um, transverse to the inclination direction. And of course, what is very interesting is this co-dimension two point here, where both of them become unstable at the same time. Why is that interesting? Well, below this point, the system is predominantly buoyancy driven. Above it, it's mostly shear driven. And here the system has, in some sense, an identity crisis. It doesn't really know what it is. Good. So these are the primary instabilities. Um, and we want to understand patterns beyond the instability. So what we therefore use as a measure now is uh, we use this rescaled Rayleigh number. So we are uh, defining this epsilon, which is the ratio of the Rayleigh number to the critical Rayleigh number for the primary instability, minus 1 so that uh, the primary instability is always at x, epsilon equal zero. Good. So this epsilon was actually the epsilon which we had here on this axis of the phase diagram. So let me give you a little bit the, the current status of, of knowledge of understanding these patterns. So we have two patterns, the longitudinal roles and the transverse roles, which are associated to the linear instability of the base state. So these two we know. But now these um, uh, secondary flows, they are 2D objects. So um, one can do a linear stability analysis of these roles and identify secondary instabilities. And these secondary instability thresholds are these curves here that I calculated here. And some of the patterns that we observe can be associated with these secondary bifurcations. So for example, here, what we call wavy rolls, or here, the transverse oscillations, the knot pattern, and or here, these so-called longitudinal subharmonic oscillations. So some of the patterns can be related to secondary bifurcations. But what about patterns which are not related to secondary bifurcations and are far from threshold? And there, I want to give you an example. I want to discuss these crawling roll patterns. So that's an example for these rich dynamics far above threshold where we have chaos, bursting, spatial localization, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me start by simply showing you a numerical simulation of this crawling roll pattern. So this is the simulation. Um, let me run this. Does it run? No, it doesn't. Now it runs. 
And uh, what I'm showing you is the temperature at the midplane um, of our cell. Um, so you can look at this for a while. Um, and what you observe, um, it's weakly chaotic. I will call this weakly turbulent. So before some people ask, I will use turbulence in the sense of spatial temporal chaos here, not in terms of a Kolmogorov cascade. So that's a weakly turbulent flow. And we would like to understand this weakly turbulent flow. So how do we do this? Well, um, the idea now is that we use a fully nonlinear dynamical systems approach. And the idea is the following abstraction. So instead of thinking about structures in the flow, like convection rolls, which are oriented in some way, um, so structures in 3D space, we are thinking about the high dimensional state space of the system. So that's the space spent by all instantaneous velocity and temperature fields. So a single point in this space will be a whole three dimensional velocity and uh, temperature distribution. And the time evolution, so how the flow changes in time, will be a trajectory in this high dimensional state space. Okay? So with this picture in mind, the base state, the conduction state, is sim similar, simply a point. It's a fixed point, an equilibrium. Um, and the idea is that what we observe as weak turbulence is mediated by other fixed points and other so-called invariant solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. So pictorially, the idea is that you have um, other of these uh, fixed point solutions here which have stable and unstable directions so that a trajectory is bouncing between these invariant solutions and thereby generating the chaotic dynamics that we perceive as weak turbulence. So a good image for this picture that was developed by these people and others is think of a pinball system in the state space of um, the flow equations. Good. Um, the idea then is that these invariant solutions really are building blocks of the dynamics. So if I understand these invariant solutions, I can make sense out of the dynamics that I observe. So that's all pictures. Um, what are these invariant solutions? Well, they are solutions of the evolution equations and the evolution equations that I'm considering are the 3D over back Bosinesk equations. So we have the standard Navier-Stokes equations for the velocity field, incompressible ones with enforcing term, which depends on temperature. And the temperature field is advected by the velocity field and diffuses. And an invariant solution now is a solution um, X for the velocity and temperature field as a function of space and time, such that the evolution after some time capital T gets back to the original point. So the flow after some point, uh, time capital T, some period T looks exactly the same as it looks like now. Um, maybe up to a symmetry operation. So the nice thing about this definition is you can now express equilibria there, it doesn't matter what this period is, but you can also have periodic solution, time periodic solution, where you have to solve for this period. Good, so how do we now solve this equation? If you think about this equation, if you discretize the flow in 10 to the six or seven uh, degrees of freedom. This is a highly coupled nonlinear equation in 10 to the 7 degrees of freedom. Um, well, that's exactly what we're developing the tools for. So um, if you want to check them out, they're publicly available here at channelflow.ch. And what it is, it's a pseudospectral um, DNS code, uh, which is combined with matrix-free Newton methods and thereby allows you to then do, um, uh, based on Arnoldi eigenvalue calculations and parametric continuation. So if you want to know the details of how we do that, then go there. Um, instead of telling you exactly how we do these things, I want to tell you what we can do with these tools. Okay, so we now need to find these invariant solutions. And let's go back to our crawling roll pattern. Um, so the question is, what is the invariant solution that we expect to underlie this dynamics? And let me run this again. And I want you now to focus on some specific point in this domain. Um, at the specific point in this domain, what you observe is that we have really a cyclic behavior, right? So you have these 
these, um, these, these weekly downstream roles, then the weekly downstream roles develop defects, the defects um, uh, somehow heal, and everything comes back to the original state. So what we really have, we have the cycle of a role defect, wavy roles, transverse breakup, and back to a role defect. So here's another example where you show you um, these different stages of the cycle in different parts of the domain. So different parts of the domain will be in a different phase. But um, obviously, uh, if you look at this, the hypothesis will be that we need a periodic orbit, a time periodic solution that underlies the growling role pattern. So our task is now how to identify this solution. And identifying this solution is difficult because um, we have so many degrees of freedom, and even if we have good Newton methods, we would have to have an extremely good guess to um, find the solution. So we cannot simply guess the solution. So we need something better. And what we are doing is uh, we're imposing symmetries on the system to constrain it and thereby reduce the complexity. Now, the important thing is if I'm imposing symmetries on the system which are part of the equivariances of the original system, then the solution that I find is also a solution of the original system. So I'm not changing the system by doing this. Okay, so the first symmetry that I want to use is um, the system is translationally invariant in two directions, in the spanwise and in the downstream direction. In other words, I can put the system into a box with periodic boundary conditions. Um, and that's what we did. So I'm now showing you um, a couple of simulations. And I show you the simulation here in three different ways. So on the left-hand side, you three see a visualization of the flow, um, specific isocontours of the temperature field. Here, I show you a time series. So this is the energy input as a function of time. And here, that's probably the most interesting one, I show you a two-dimensional projection of this infinite dimensional state space that I was talking about before. And the two directions is here, the energy input. And on this axis, I have energy dissipation normalized by the energy input. Why do I do this? Well, for a fixed point, dissipation and energy input have to balance. So a fixed point has to lie on this line here with a one, okay? So I'm now starting um, the simulation with a little bit of initial noise. And let's simply look at what happens here. So we're starting from the base state. The base state then um, moves transiently to this longitudinal rolls. It seems to here approach another um, fixed point solution, which is unstable. But then what you see is you see still chaotic behavior. So if you look at the face portrait, um, it fills the whole um, space, okay? But what we already have seen here is we have seen evidence, this first evidence, to really transient visits of these fixed point solutions. So maybe I run it again. You start it here, it transiently, of course, I stopped the video here a little bit, it transiently goes to the longitudinal rolls, then it transiently goes to another fixed point, and then it starts becoming um, chaotic. So we have first evidences for these transient visits. But we don't have a periodic orbit. So let's do the following. Let's increase the symmetries even more. In other words, I now put this into a smaller periodic box. And uh, we do the same thing. Um, I start the simulation with a little bit of noise. We already know we are going close to the longitudinal rolls. Now, this is just an, an, a zoom in. Here, we are spiraling into another one fixed point along a, a stable direction, but it's unstable. So we're leaving it along its unstable direction and we are approaching another fixed point here. Now, this fixed point here is actually not the attractor, but what the attractor really is, it's a homoclinic orbit of this fixed point. Okay, nice. Um, so we've now really seen clear evidence for transient visits to two non-trivial fixed point solutions and uh, we've seen a specific attractor. But this attractor is again not a periodic orbit. So let's put even more symmetry constraints on the system. And I want to put a symmetry constraint on the system which disallows this attractor here. But it turns out that this is also an equivariance of the system. So this is a shift and rotate symmetry. 
So now I impose the shift and rotate symmetry, and then I do the same uh, just for a time integration. We already know the visit to this solution. And then what you see is that uh, what emerges is an attracting limit cycle. An attracting, it will slow down in a second. And this attracting limit cycle um, gives you access to a periodic orbit solution of the equations. So we now really found a periodic orbit. So what have we done here? Um, what we've done here is that by uh, increasing the symmetries, we went from chaos in a small uh, box to transient uh, chaos near unstable states. So first chaotic and then it's settling in here to a periodic attractor. But as I said before, the main point is that imposing these symmetries only gives us access to the solution. So for example, the periodic orbit solution is still present um, in the larger periodic box and it's present in the whole, uh, full system with an infinitely extended domain. So what is the result here of all of this, um, um, all of the um, enterprise here is we really found by doing this five invariant solutions of the equations. Let's count the base state, the longitudinal rolls here, then something that we call the wavy rolls, the ones that we are going to here um, along a spiraling stable uh, manifold. Then here the oblique wavy rolls and the uh, associated homoclinic orbit. And number five, and most importantly, this crawling roll um, periodic orbit. So these invariant solutions are indeed transiently visited by the chaotic dynamics as the picture of the, um, the, um, um, the pinball machine suggests, and they capture key features of the flow. So if you don't believe the last point, let me show you again snapshots from the DNS that we discussed before. And now I put next to that the periodic orbit. And I think you agree with me that this periodic orbit extremely well captures the core dynamics of this crawling roll pattern. So if you look at this here in the different phases, it's really the same thing. Okay, good. So now we've really established that these invariant solutions, in this case, a periodic orbit capture the dynamics. The next question that you can ask is where does this um, uh, crawling roll orbit come from? In other words, we can do a bifurcation analysis. So we found all of these orbits at an epsilon of 0.5, or all of these invariant solutions at an epsilon of 0.5. And now we can do arc length continuation. So here, this is, for example, the longitudinal rolls. I'm showing you the norm of the temperature field in the, um, in the deviation from the base flow. So zero here is the base flow. And the longitudinal rolls bifurcate from the base flow at epsilon equals zero. That's exactly how epsilon was defined. Then our wavy rolls, they bifurcate from the longitudinal rolls in a pitchfork bifurcation. Um, the oblique wavy rolls terminate on both sides. Um, on the left-hand side, they give us access, uh, they, they are terminating on the oblique rolls in the same way how the longitudinal rolls and the wavy rolls are connected. On the upper side, they terminate on a new uh, branch that we didn't know before. These are the so-called longitudinal plumes. But most interesting is, of course, the crawling roll periodic orbit. And because it's a periodic orbit, I'm now showing you two lines, the maximum and the minimum of this norm over the orbit. So there are two lines, but it's a single branch. So this orbit now uh, terminates on both sides. On the lower end here, it's a very interesting global bifurcation involving the longitudinal rolls. But on the upper end, it bifurcates from another periodic orbit, the so-called longitudinal plume oscillations. So if you would really count in terms of a sequence of bifurcations, the crawling rolls that we got is a quaternary state. So from the base state to the longitudinal plumes, to the longitudinal plume oscillations, to the crawling rolls. Okay, so this was only for an inclination angle of 40 degrees, but now you can go a little bit crazy and even vary this angle. 
And just to give you a little bit of an idea, so this is a subset of all of, of a subset of solution branches of these invariant solutions that you can identify in inclined layer convection. And why are we so excited about it? Well, um, you have these many um, different invariant solutions, and the idea is that if these solutions underlie the spatial temporal convection patterns at specific parameters, then you only have to go to these parameters, figure out which of these invariant solutions you have there, and thereby understand what you will be uh, observed in the dynamics. So my hope really is that I've convinced you that these exact invariant solutions are really building blocks of the complex fully nonlinear dynamics and capture um, features of the flow. So one question is now, you might say, oh yeah, that's very nice, but are you not overselling this completely? Because I mean, you started showing us localized spots and then you're talking about solutions in a small periodic domain. Well, that's a valid question. Um, so let me give you very briefly in the interest of time, a little bit of an idea for uh, another pattern. So these are the so-called transverse bursts. And the transverse bursts are emerging close to this co-dimension two point. And here's a simulation. So what do you see? You see a background of longitudinal roles. And on this background, you then get locally, local in space and local in time, these um, intense regions of convection uh, characterized by a chevron -like pattern, okay? So that's a very interesting um, complex um, uh, pattern. And if we want to understand this, there are two features that we would need to explain. One is this bursting in time so that it suddenly comes up in time, and the other one is localization in space. So can we do this again with our invariant solutions? The answer is yes. Um, and you can ask me a lot of, uh, about a lot of details, but just to give you a glimpse of that. So the bursting in time, we managed to explain by observing the following things. We have again, these phase portraits. So um, we are close to the co-dimension two points. So both longitudinal and transverse roles can play a role. The initial trajectory passes by the transverse roles, goes to the longitudinal roles but the longitudinal roles are unstable. And then there's an extremely quick and extremely energetic heteroclinic connection towards a new state that we identify, which captures the internals of this chevron pattern. So the strong bursting in time is mediated by a heteroclinic connection between these two states. And localization in space, well, localization in space would suggest that maybe you have invariant solutions where you have this connection from longitudinal roles to chevrons, but localized. So can you have a solution where you have a longitudinal role background and locally a patch of chevron solutions? Well, it's a nonlinear equation, so you cannot simply superimpose them, but it turns out that there are really invariant solutions of this type. So this is an invariant solution of the full nonlinear evolution equations. And this here is time evolution. And I think you can agree with me simply visually that it's obvious that these invariant solutions capture a lot of the dynamics. Okay, good. So um, that's almost what I already wanted to say about fluids. So let me summarize a little bit of where we are here before we switch to the second story. So, um, the system that I looked at is convection in an inclined layer. And the question was, can we describe the chaotic dynamics via bouncing between unstable invariant solutions of the equations? Uh, the tools then are symmetry reduced DNS, fixed point surges, parametric continuation. And using these tools, we managed to identify invariant solutions of the full nonlinear 3D equations like this periodic orbit. They capture key features of the complex dynamics, and they are indeed transiently visited by the dynamics. So in this sense, they form the backbone of the nonlinear evolution. And what I like so much about this system, and that's why I like talking about it, is um, you don't have to believe in this picture of a pinball machine in state space, which we've been doing for a long time in shear flows. Here, you can directly observe it. You can directly see 
this bounds in between invariant solutions. So what's the relevance of all of this? Well, the relevance is of course that we can explain uh, convection patterns that are not captured by linear or weakly nonlinear theory. But the second important thing is that you might have realized that in the moment we switched from the fluids description to the abstract description of a point evolving in state space, the rest of the analysis was independent of the system being a fluid system. So these are very general methods, which I think should be and can be and should be applied to a lot of situations where um, nonlinear evolution is present. And to demonstrate this, I want to um, now tell you a second story. And the second story will be a story in solid mechanics. Good, so what's the question? The question is, is completely seemingly very simple question. And the idea is take an elastic sheet, roll the elastic sheet into a cylinder and ask yourself how much load can you put on the cylinder before this buckles and collapses, okay? So the question is, the seemingly simple question is, what is the critical buckling load of an axially loaded cylinder shaft? So how would we all do this? Well, uh, we would write down the equations for elastic equilibrium. Um, we would then um, do a stability analysis for the loaded base state and search for a linear instability. And if you do this, you get a very classical result for the critical stress expressed in terms of the bulk modulus, the Poisson ratio, and uh, the thickness of the shell divided by the radius of the cylinder. So that's a classical result. Unfortunately, if you do experiments, this is what you get. So here I'm showing you um, a lot of experiments mostly connected by NASA, and I'm showing you on this axis the experimentally measured buckling load normalized by the theoretical prediction. So that's called the knockdown factor. And I'm showing you this as a function of R over T. So the shell thickness gets, uh, shell gets thinner and thinner here to the right. And because I'm normalizing by the theoretical prediction, linear stability suggests here that we have this red line at one. But obviously the data doesn't, um, doesn't follow this linear prediction. Instead, um, there's a clear failure of linear theory um, and nominally identical shells buckle at different loads. So it looks stochastic. So why is that? Well, we know for a long time what the reason for that is, and that's extreme sensitivity of the problem to imperfections. So with this imperfections in mind, how could you predict the buckling load of an individual shell? Well, the linear approach is the following. Um, think of an imperfection modifying the linear stability threshold. So if we look here at a schematic bifurcation diagram, let's only look at the black um, parts right now. So here, this is the end-to-end -end shortening as a function of controlled load. Then the loaded base state here, um, uh, the more I load it, the shorter the cylinder gets. And at some point, the base state loses its linear stability. In the backward bifurcation, this is where we induce buckling. That's our theoretical prediction. Now the idea is that if you have imperfections, they will round off this sharp um, uh, corner here and move your linear stability threshold down, okay? So you still have a linear instability, but it happens at a different load. So with this picture in mind, if you know exactly what your imperfections are, then you can predict the buckling load. And that's very nice but it's often not very useful because you typically have no idea what the imperfections really are. And therefore, many people try to come up with ideas of what is a typical imperfection to get an idea of what are the typical buckling loads that we have here, okay? But we want to do something different. And what we want to do is, and you shouldn't be surprised by this by now, we want to do a fully nonlinear um, uh, analysis uh, inspired by exactly these dynamical systems methods that I explained to you in the setting of fluid dynamics. So why would one want to do this? Well, the reason is the following. So the first time I saw this NASA data, 
Um, I literally saw this uh, sitting on the desk of one of the giants in the field. And I only saw the data and had no idea what is on the axis. And I thought I'd seen the data before because this reminded me of this famous data. So this is famous data by Tom Mullen on the transition to turbulence in pipe flow. So pipe flow is linearly stable. And here Tom Mullen was measuring the um, strength of a perturbing jet needed to trigger the, the transition to turbulence. These are the red dots versus um, uh, decaying uh, turbulence as a function of Reynolds number. And you, you might admit that this looks more or less similar. It looks even more similar if I take the buckling data and flip the axis. Because now I have on the right axis a control parameter here, the Reynolds number, here the imposed load. And on this axis, I have the amplitude of a perturbation. Well, here I don't have the amplitude of a perturbation, but I have the radius of a thickness ratio. And now you can start waving your hands and can say, well, the thinner a shell is, the harder it's probably to produce a perfect shell. So let's take this as a proxy for a perturbation amplitude. And then these two things look very similar. Now, um, that suggests a paradigm shift here. And the idea would be that we try to understand buckling not as a linear instability of an imperfect system, but like fluid dynamics here, like, like shear flow transition, as a nonlinear finite amplitude instability of the perfect system. So let me tell you how, um, uh, what I have in mind from the fluids perspective again. So um, if you look at pipe flow, uh, studied for a long time, so this is Osborn Reynolds famous experiment where he visualized the state of the flow by um, a streak of dyed fluid um, uh, entering here at the pipe. You have one control parameter, the Reynolds number, but for the same Reynolds number, you have two states that are possible, the laminar state and the turbulent state. And what you really need, because the laminar solution remains linearly stable, you need um, a finite amplitude perturbation to trigger turbulence. And that's exactly what Tom Mullen was doing. He was therefore taking a very nice smooth pipe where there are no uh, background, in, uh, background perturbations that uh, trigger turbulence naturally, but he has a nice pipe and then applied a lateral jet um, and then measured how strong this lateral jet has to be to trigger turbulence, okay? So how do we rationalize this from a dynamical systems point of view? We've now learned all of this. Um, we are again thinking of an evolution of a state space point um, given by the Navier-Stokes equations. Then uh, if we're thinking of a 2D projection of the state space, we have a uh, laminar flow, which is again a fixed point. It's linearly stable, so it's attracting, but it's surrounded by its basin of attraction, which for reasons that I don't want to go into, is often called the edge of chaos. And this basin of attraction, the boundary, um, gives you uh, the distinction between perturbations that trigger turbulence and those that do not. So this is a very complicated object because it's a co-dimension one manifold in this high dimensional state space. But luckily, we learned that there are invariant solutions, so-called edge states, which are embedded in the basin boundary. And these edge states are specific solutions in the basin boundary, um, which have a single unstable direction, which means, if you think of this in kind of a 3D visualization, they have a single unstable direction, um, and all other directions are stable. In other words, this basin boundary is at least locally the stable manifold of this state. And there are other unstable fixed points in there. So it turns out that we've learned in fluids that these unstable equilibrium states in the basin boundary are key for guiding the transition to turbulence. So what we now want to do is we want to transfer these concepts to shell buckling. So the idea now is um, we are thinking about the original uh, schematic bifurcation diagram but we are thinking about uh, buckling triggered by pushing the system from its base state over this point outside its basin of attraction. And that means what we need now to do is we need to characterize the size of the basin of attraction as a function of the loading conditions. And how do we do this? Well, we try to find these um, edge states embedded in the basin boundary. 
okay? So how do we do this? Um, well, I had a slide here, which I probably don't need for all of our fluids people to remind everyone why um, uh, elasticity is in general nonlinear. So quickly for all of you, um, how does elasticity work? Well, you have a deformation of um, uh, an elastic object from one state to another one that generates strains and then the elastic object responds by uh, developing stresses that are causing the initial deformation. And the key thing is that the strain, simply for geometric reasons, is already a nonlinear function of the displacement field. So even if you have a linear stress-strain relation and you write down the force balance here, let's assume we uh, can look at the overdamped limit uh, so that we are first order in time, this is automatically an equation where the unbalanced forces are nonlinear functions of the displacement field. So um, what we are getting is we are getting a dynamical system of a similar structure as the Navier-Stokes equations. Good. So we are working here with shells. So what did we practically do? We took um, the appropriate 2D asymptotic reduction of 3D elasticity, um, so-called DMD shell equations, and put them on the computer. So using finite differences and semi-implicit time stepping. And now that we can integrate these equations forward in time, we can do what we wanted to do. We want to construct this nonlinear equilibria on the basin boundary of the unbuckled state. Again, we cannot just guess them, so we have to do something smarter. And here we are again using a method that has been uh, developed in fluid dynamics. And the idea is very simple. The idea is, imagine you have two initial conditions, so two initial deformations on either side of the basin boundary, okay? Then one is outside the basin of attraction, so it will move away from the unbuckled state towards collapse, whereas the one inside the basin boundary will go back to the unbuckled state. So you have these two trajectories, and in between there will be an initial condition that neither collapses nor goes back to the unbuckled state, but remains in the stability boundary. And if you can find this one, which you can do by shooting methods, then it will approach automatically the attractor embedded in the basin boundary, which is this edge state. Okay, this is the schematic. Here's a real calculation. Um, so this is the energy uh, stored in the deformation field. So the undeformed state here is at zero. The red curves are the trajectories that are going towards buckling. The blue ones are the ones that go back to the unbuckled state. And you see that it settles on uh, a constant value. So um, what is this? Two, you yeah. have two more minutes, sorry. Seven, okay. Let me, let me see. Okay, so this is the state that we get there, okay? And the state that we are getting here is a localized dimple solution. So this is a fixed point, uh, an equilibrium of the equations. Um, here I unroll it a little bit. Um, here's a cross section. So it's a very shallow dimple, okay? And now the question is, um, so we have this edge state on the basin boundary. The question is, what is its significance? And then we started doing experiments and experiments both with my good friend Shmo Rubinstein and uh, a very good uh, postdoc, Emmanuel Biro is a joint postdoc there who made all of these experiments possible. And I believe he actually has partly a history at LADIX. Um, and what we wanted to do there is we wanted to apply controlled perturbations to a loaded shell in the sense of redoing Tom Mullins' pipe flow experiment. But instead of having a pipe and perturbing it with a jet on the side, the idea now is we take a shell, we load it, and we poke it from the side. So what Emmanuel likes to show is he always likes to show this one. So essentially, we are doing a very controlled version of this experiment. So um, how do you expect the data to look like? So imagine that this is our basin boundary at a fixed load. Here is my unbuckled state. Here is my edge state that looks like a single dimple deformation. Now, let's assume I control the deformation of the poker and measure the force on the poker. How do I expect 
this force deformation curve to look like? Well, if I poke, I define a direction in my high dimensional state space in the direction of dimple deformations. So if I deform it a little bit away from the unbuckled state, my force will of course go up. But now if I'm approaching this edge state, I'm reaching a state which is already a force equilibrium of the equations without the poker. So at this moment, I don't need any force here anymore, uh, but the force should go down. So if everything that I'm telling you is correct, this is how the force displacement curve should look like. And exactly where the force goes to zero, I reach the edge state, and this is where I should induce buckling. So let's look at the data. I'm showing you the data um, as a function of process time. So here, this is both the force on uh, the axial axis and on the, on the poker. So we are first loading um, the shell to 300 Newton, then we're fixing the end-to-end -end displacement. Now the poker comes in at a constant speed. Here it touches the shell and it goes up. So nothing looks like uh, what I showed you. But we're only loading the shell to 300 Newton. So let's load it to 900 Newtons. So the problem is exactly what we want to understand. Most of these shells buckle before you reach 900 Newtons. But now you find a good one, which you can load to 900 Newtons. Here, the poker comes in, force goes up, force goes down, and exactly where the force goes down, um, you are inducing buckling. So um, the observation is buckling is really induced when the edge state um, uh, is reached, and that confirms that uh, we can think about this as a nonlinear finite amplitude instability. So I only have uh, two more slides, so um, I'm despite two stories trying to stay in time. So what have we now done? So we have um, identified this edge state equilibrium on the basin boundary. The properties are it's this shallow localized single dimple deformation. It's dynamically unstable. It defines critical amplitudes for triggering buckling. Um, it's spatially localized, so it has nothing to do with what you would get out of a linear stability analysis. And, and that's a key point, it's experimentally accessible without destroying the shell because I can detect when my force tends towards zero without going there. So I can localize this edge state without destroying it. And that allows me now to um, start predicting when shells buckle. So how do I do this? I do two things. I use this edge state to measure the size of the basin of attraction as a function of loading conditions. So how can I do this? Well, I follow the edge state as a function of axial load. I can do this either numerically by continuation, or I do this experimentally where I combine these load displacement curves into something which we call a stability landscape. But both of them um, are ideas to measure the size of the basin of attraction as a function of loading conditions. And if I can do this, then I can extrapolate to the point where the basin of attraction vanishes. And that gives me a prediction. That's what we are currently working on. So um, again, one question that you might ask, how can you tell me that you're characterizing the size of the size of the basin of attraction if you have a single point on it? Well, just to kind of um, uh, assure you, this is one of these equilibria and uh, these are other equilibria on the basin boundary. So we can really characterize the basin boundary. With that, um, let me conclude and summarize the second problem. So the second problem is, the question was, how much load can a cylinder shell carry before it buckles and collapses? Um, by transferring concepts from fluid mechanics, we realized that there's a similarity between turbulence transition and shell buckling. Based on that, we decided to try to describe the system as a nonlinear instability triggered by finite amplitude perturbations. We managed to find these edge states, which are unstable equilibria on the basin boundary, and their significance is they define critical perturbation amplitudes, and uh, they have a structure which is the one of localized dimples. And why, do we, uh, why are we so excited about this? Well, we're excited about it because we think we can get finally a predictive theory for buckling thresholds of thin shell structures without our priori knowledge of the imperfections. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Tobias, for this very nice, uh, clear talk. Um, let's let's have our panelists start some discussions. Please, if someone would like um, to go first. Yeah, Basil, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I have a very specific question. <laughs> uh, oh. Thanks, thanks for the beautiful talk. Um, uh, I was wondering, for, for the first part of your talk, you run separate sim uh, simulations imposing additional symmetries to identify yes. these periodic orbits and, and stable points, but the data is all essentially already present in your uh, initial full simulations. So I was wondering, have you thought of a way to extract, uh, you know, by si some kind of uh, wavelet uh, uh, processing the, the data from your initial simulations and directly uh, identify these periodic or orbits? Or uh, stable? Okay, so we have thought about, look, the, the, the point is the following. Um, what you always have to do in all of these things, in the end, uh, you need to feed a nonlinear solver, a Newton method with a guess, which is good enough um, to find your solution. And there are multiple ways of, of now going for this. Um, you can either kind of do things like what you have suggested of extracting initial guesses directly from the original data. Um, the issue with this, it's typically, it typically doesn't really work because in so high dimensions, you have a lot of space. So even something which looks very close to the solution is very far away of it uh, if you are in, in 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 dimensions. Mm. Um, so what we typically uh, do is we're trying either these edge tracking concepts or symmetry reduction uh, to somehow generate a dynamical system where these things become dynamically stable. Um, that's one thing. Um, but your, your point is an extremely good one, um, if I, you know, because another point, another way of, of doing this is, of course, if you would manage to have a better method to converge these solutions, so something like a magically powerful Newton method, which has an extremely large convergence radius, then you don't need to be that precise anymore with your initial guess. And that's what we are currently working on. So we are currently trying specifically for periodic orbits to um, uh, use very different methods, which are not Newton methods, to um, do this convergence to the solution. And if they work, if we manage to get this running, then we'll be in a situation where um, we can uh, generate initial guesses probably better directly from data. Okay. So if, if I may interject, uh, you know, related to, to the point that you just mentioned, I mean, I, this is a fantastic work. Uh, I'm very impressed. I, I have some, some concern about, probably it's related to the question that you asked. How do you know that you've got all these uh, unstable invariant solutions? Well, that's a perfect question because I think the answer is um, we probably will never be able to do that. We will never, I think there's no way of us ever, okay. So that's the short answer. The longer answer is, I think what you're referring to is, there's a long dream uh, based on, on, on low dimensional dynamical systems to do something called periodic orbit theory. So really writing down uh, statistical properties of the flow as averages over these periodic orbits. Mm -hmm. And these things require in some sense, uh, a way of, of having a complete set of these orbits. Um, though I doubt that this would be possible in these fluid problems um, for a technical problem which has something to do with the non-existence of a symbolic dynamics. But what we can do is we can try to extract as many as we can. And that, of course, means we have to have better tools. And then we can, we, we can simply compare the predictions that we have for statistics based on the orbits that we have to the statistics that we observe either in numerics or in experiments and thereby, you know, kind of sort of backtrack whether we've at least kind of identified the most relevant ones. Yeah, but uh, the question is a perfect question. I, I think the honest answer is I don't see any way of ever knowing that we've found all of the orbits. Mm -hmm. I'm really playing devil's advocate. Huh? Uh, no, 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 but that's perfect. I, I, I think that, that the intuition that you use to capture these uh, unstable solutions is uh, is amazing. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a very nice idea to put this. But I think we also, I mean, another thing that's important to say, I think what I'm doing here is I'm not yet trying to do really um, periodic orbit theory in the sense of trying to predict statistical properties quantitatively. The idea really is to um, capture specific features of the flow in um, these invariant solutions. 
um, because then you have a chance of understanding what is mechanistically happening, really, mm -hmm. because it's no longer a stochastic problem or a cardiac problem where you can only talk about averages. You have a very well-defined object with very specific solution of the equations, uh, and you can, can, can try to understand this solution. That's mm -hmm. the idea. And uh, uh, another question that I have is uh, regarding the fact that you focused in, in your, the fluid part of your talk uh, on a problem which has a, a very nice ingredient which helps greatly, which is convection. Uh, yeah. Do you do, so that that do you agree that this makes your job a bit easier? Oh, and it makes it much easier. So the reason why I'm so excited about this system is um, that something slightly counterintuitive happens. So compared to a pure shear flow, we are adding another field. So instead of having only our velocity now, I have to keep track of temperature. So it seems like a more complicated problem. Mm -hmm. But the problem is much easier to handle from an numerical point also than a shear flow. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is we really have this linear instabilities around. So we can kind of have a small uh, a stepwise sequence towards more complex behavior. And then um, I have the strong suspicion, and I can't really prove this yet, but we are working on that. What I think makes convection considerably easier than a shear flow is the much smaller um, uh, amount of non-normality. Non has some, I mean, I think this is much closer to a normal problem. So yeah. all transient growth effects, which numerically make shear flows very, very challenging, are a little bit less prevalent here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you anyway. I think it's beautiful stuff. So Nick has you next up. Yeah. First, uh, I would like to thank uh, Tobias for a wonderful talk. And actually, I would like to mention it's the first uh, time that uh, I see some uh, ideas coming from another community in the very classical problem of uh, cylinder uh, shell buckling. It's very refreshing. So it's wonderful. Uh, the question that I would like to ask is exactly how you use this in the first part of the talk. Obviously, your sister has, uh, you know, has many symmetries, and it's the breaking of the symmetries that they, you know, get to this different bifurcated solution. And you very cleverly uh, reduce uh, the space that uh, uh, you're looking for solution, taking into account the symmetries that are, of course, symmetries of the that, that are, of course, solutions of the original problem, and you find out uh, the attractors. I do not see uh, any of these wonderful ideas applied in the uh, cylinder problem, talking about the symmetries and the different groups that you have and so on and so forth. In the second problem, because the very reason that uh, we have knockdown factor is exactly the multiple solutions in the, and the many symmetries that the problem yeah. has. You've shown, uh, and actually I thought, I mean, you know, you, you have the idea, so it would be wonderful to, and I'll tell you why I say that, because you only show uh, the principal solution and one bifurcated uh, solution that uh, is imperfection sensitive and so on and so forth. The real problem is from that bifurcated solution, you have secondary and tertiary bifurcated solutions. I know. And push the, uh, the, lim the, the minimum load much further down, which is exactly why you see the, uh, the knockdown factor. So there's a symmetry argument that uh, is underlying there that reduces the uh, knockdown factor. And actually, there's the work by um, uh, uh, Tim Healy and uh, you know, his PhD student, uh, Andrew Wooliver, back in the late 90s, that uh, they followed all the secondary, mm -hmm. tertiary, all these bifurcated solutions to find out uh, what is going on. The thing that I liked, and I would like to understand a bit more, uh, is that you convert, because there's no dynamics, obviously, in the shell buckling problem. Uh, it's uh, you know the multiplicity. I mean we're yeah I mean we're we're considering here the you over dynamics, but if you really right. want to take in if, if you if you really want to allow the shell to to to, to oscillate and take the inertial terms into account, exactly. so you put of course do it. Okay, so you put artificial viscosity to guide it to different solutions, which is perfectly fine because there'll be. Uh, a well, my my argument is a slightly different one here. My argument is that. What I want to do in principle is I want to understand the stability of an equilibrium. And the stability of an equilibrium, uh, you can backtrack even under, um, under, under second order dynamics from the first order dynamics, right? I mean, if you're only carrying, if your initial conditions that you're considering, your perturbations, always have zero, maybe let's talk about energy. If, 
if, if, if you're considering uh, the stability with respect to deformations, uh, which are only deformations in space, so they only impose a certain uh, elastic energy, but they don't have any kinetic energy contribution, then I think it's fine to work with um, the um, overdamped dynamics. Um, but conceptually, there's no problem to think about um, the non overdamped dynamics. And that's actually a very interesting thing because, um, you know, what is a basin boundary for the first order dynamics doesn't immediately, it's not immediately clear how this translates into a basin boundary for a second order dynamics. Because in the second order dynamics, of course, your whole state space becomes a phase space which also involves all of the velocities. So um, I think it would be very interesting at some point. Um, so, so one of the many directions in which we are going, and the main direction is really to take into account imperfections in the whole analysis. But one of the other ideas is really to go for the dynamics of buckling, uh, and that would involve uh, considering, of course, the second order inertial dynamics. The, the point I'm trying to make is that if you would like to solve uh, the knockdown factor, actually, you have the solution in front of your eyes. If you try to find out what is the low enough load that you don't find any solutions, any attractors. In which yes, but, 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 but Nick, look, um, I think I, 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 I so two, two things about this. I think one thing that we, we need to do, the solutions that I showed you here, are all solutions of a shell without imperfections, right? It's a, for a perfect shell. That's how they are, they are done. Um, and what and we need to do is can be defined for the shell without any imperfections. That's the whole idea of the knockdown factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure, sure. But in order to say, let me, let me I'm, I'm trying to get to the right point here. Um, Listen, let me, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. It's wonderful work. No, 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 but look, look, look here. Yes. So we can take it later on if you want. I send you an email, I would like- No, 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 but it's perfect, but it's, but it's perfect. But look, um, so I think there are two things that we need to do. One is, I think it's definitely important to figure out the structural stability of all of the solutions with respect to imperfections in the base state. And that's one of the things that we are now aiming for. So the idea is, can I figure out what these states are doing if I have imperfections in the base state. And I think it's important to, to figure out which of the, so some things of these solutions will change. So yeah, all of the solutions here, I, I didn't have time to really go into this. So this here is a bifurcation diagram. And one of the things which just might, might, might be very interesting, you realize that the single dimple solution only exists down to about 0.45, so 45% of the critical load, which is strangely close to the NASA um, uh, design rule. Um, so look, um, I think what you're saying is, is, is true that we should kind of look a little bit more into um, uh, other solutions, trying to find the lowest solutions uh, in order to find in some sense, geometrically the point of the basin boundary that is in some, uh, uh, some appropriate norm closest to the unbuckled state. But I think the second thing that we need to do is we need to reintroduce the concept of imperfections in the base state in the whole system. So what I ideally want to do is I want to know what are equilibrium deformations for a non-perfect cylinder. Okay, because that's sort of, I think, what you need, where, where we can also find out. You made, you made the point of knockdown factor, and there is no guarantee that it's these patterns that are going to give you the uh, most important knockdown factor. No, that's true, but I think the only way to figure out which ones are and which ones are not, I think, again, I think one of the many things that need to be done now is really kind of, sort of looking at the structural stability of all of these solutions with respect to imperfection. So for example, if my solution disappears as soon as I have a small imperfection in the loading conditions, then it's probably not very relevant in reality, right? So I think, yeah. So I think there are multiple things that have to happen, but what I, I mean, the, the state where we are at right now is simply that the similarity between these two problems simply suggests a slightly different way of thinking about the, the buckling problem. And 
uh, I think the verdict, whether this really leads to better practical predictions or not, is completely out there. It, I mean, I'm not saying that this will be in any way um, give you better predictions than, than classical methods yet. I think it has the potential simply because it's a different way of thinking about it. Well, but how far we get, nobody knows. The perhaps take is that you have a wonderful way to solve the knockdown problem for the perfect cylinder, uh, which is beautiful. That's what I like. But let me stop here. We can discuss and continue the discussion later on again. Beautiful work. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Christoph, would you yes. like to? Hi. Good afternoon. So my, my question is maybe maybe two in one. So you know I see a difference between your uh, your solid uh, um, case and the liquid uh, the fluid one in the sense that in the fluid we have these domains of different uh, unstable or different states. And uh, can your method give some idea about the how this domain grows inside each other? You know all this problem of uh, uh, which to, 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 to turbulence. And inside this question, can you do the same thing or can you have a, a uh, what, what state or the different states in the um, in the solid mechanics case? I don't see that. I'm, 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 I'm not sure I completely got your question. So you are asking about the spatial temporal aspect. Exactly. Of it, uh -huh. right? can, can you say something about the domain uh, the domain uh, interaction in the fluids? Uh, okay, do okay. you have such domain? And, and, and the question which is in that uh, uh, following that is: Do you have such kind? Of, do, does exist such, such type of domain in the solid? Cases. I'm not sure, but well, in the so okay, okay. Let me let me answer in two different ways. Let, let me take the second one first. That that's in some sense easier. So um, uh, what we already see is that we can have. I mean, the solution that you see is a perfect example of that. The solution is completely localized. So it's in part of the shell domain. There is a, a, an equilibrium solution there, uh, which is not the base state. And if you're going towards these ones here, you see that um, I have all of these solutions which have compact support. So I have also a system where, um, you know, in space they are localized. And now if you're thinking about dynamics, the question of course is where is the dynamics important in the, in the buckling problem? Um, because in principle it's, you know, it's different from turbulence. I mean, once you initiate the buckling, it's very interesting how the buckling propagates around the shell. Um, but once it has propagated and the shell has collapsed, then, then, then uh, that's the end. But there are definitely, definitely um, uh, spatial aspects of um, uh, the buckling problem. So there's the, there's the, there's the, the, the evol evolution in space um, of these buckling patterns. So that's something that we also see in experiments um, where you initiate buckling locally and then this buckling Kind of propagates around around the whole shell. Um, so that was that was a simpler version. I'm not sure whether this was exactly your question. Well, that's um, right, that's right. And then can you can you say something about you know there are, there are some uh, some laws or at least a lot of studies in the fluid case or, about the the how the domain grows. You know, the, the, uh, you of, uh, how the turbulence domain grows inside the laminar. Ah, okay. Now I understand what you mean. You want to, for example, say, can we do any prediction of how quickly a turbulence spot or oh, at which rate a turbulence spot exactly. grows, right? No, there are all these theories about percolation or things like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, no, that's perfect. Look, um, I don't think we can do this yet, but I give you an idea of how we potentially could. Um, so um, uh, the question refers to the idea that there has been enormous progress in recent years, um, driven uh, to a large extent by, by, by Björn Hof and, and collaborators. Um, uh, Johan de Gay uh, and others, Mark Avila, are involved in this, um, to describe the statistics of um, uh, spatial temporal intermittency in turbulence um, using or mapping this on uh, equilibrium phase transitions of directed percolation time. Okay. And they have um, measured spreading rates of turbulence and things like that. Um, so it would, of course, be nice to get these, um, these, these statistical properties out of the invariant solutions. Currently, we don't really have, but in principle, it would be possible. Imagine, for example, I have an invariant solution of a certain spatial size and one of a slightly bigger size. And imagine that in the state space, the dynamics moves from one to the other. That's what has to happen if it grows. So if I now know, um, what is the, tra the, the, the transit path along this 
um, heteroclinic orbit from this solution to this solution, and I know the size difference between the solution, I might be, maybe have an idea of how um, to get the spreading rates. What I think is the, is the even nicer idea, and this is sort of the dream that Breda Kitanovic, for example, had, is that you completely give up on the whole idea of evolution in time. But what you do is you describe the statistics as space-time solutions. Yeah. So these are all solutions where space and time is treated on equal footing. Um, and then you simply have an enumeration in the same way how statistical mechanics works. Um, so I think that's probably the better way of thinking about it, but it poses huge computational problems because then, you know, a 3D problem becomes uh, a solution of a, of a 4D boundary value problem um, of Stefan's type because you don't know the periods and everything. So it's complicated to do, but conceptually that's probably the right way to think about it. And, uh, yeah, and, and finally, my question was, I don't see how that can adapt to the solid buckling problem, but that's... I think the solid problem is a different one, right? That's why I wanted to start probably some analogy, but probably some differences on that aspect. No, no, I mean, the key thing, I think the key thing is, this is not really kind of a, con it's not, an, not a constantly driven system, right? You know, the, the elasticity problem is a variational problem, you know, it goes down to an energy. So you will not have periodic, uh, you will not have chaotic attractors, you will not have periodic orbits and things like that. It's some, you know, it's a, you could, oh, you could I mean, reinterpret everything that I said, you could reinterpret as specific points in an energy landscape, which in the fluid system we cannot do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you you can much. take, yeah. thanks, Christoph. Uh, we can take one last question from the audience. Costas, you can um, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tobias. It's Costas Danas. Uh, oh, perfect. How, how are you? Good. Uh, very nice talk. I, I liked a lot the, the analogies between the two. Um, I have a question about the cell buckling uh, and the importance of the poking. So what if, for example, I mean, the original problem you're interested, of course, to solve is the, the buckling under compressive load of a cylinder. Yes. So the question is, uh, this poking apparently can um, tune somehow this, this load in a more controlled way. What if we start poking in more points? What if we start localizing at different positions? Sure, but but look look for example look for example at this plot at, at these curves here. You know. Yes, I mean um, the, the question is motivated by this by this exactly exactly by this. exactly. Um, yes. So so um, in principle, a specific po a specific spatial distribution of poking defines one specific direction in this high dimensional dimensional state space in which direction I try to find where my basin boundary is located. So in principle, you probably have to kind of sort of poke in multiple um, um, directions. However, the poking in with, with one poker um, seems to already give us enormous amount of information. A, we have a lot of experimental evidence that this works. Um, so so uh, we've done a couple of more things towards the prediction business, which I didn't have time to talk about, and that works with a single poker. But you can also rationalize it, and you can rationalize it a little bit when thinking about uh, the discussion for the last question. Um, because elasticity is a, is, a, is, a, is a variational problem where you can talk about energy, so energy becomes suddenly a, a good norm in some sense, a good way of, of, of measuring the size of perturbations. And if you look at these different invariant solutions here, the different equilibria, they are all dimple solutions of a similar type, but you have multiple of these dimples. So the lowest energy of all of them will probably be the one with a single dimple. And if this one is therefore, in some energy sense, the, uh, the one closest to the, to the unbuckled state, it will probably be, in some sense, the most dangerous one. Now, I know that what I'm saying is a lot of waving hands, in principle, you're of course right. Um, uh, uh, we need to probe the basin of attraction in more than just a single direction, which is easy to do uh, experimentally. But the observation is that even if we're just probing in this one direction, we already get enormous information about the size of the domain, uh, basin of attraction. And we get so much information that from this information alone, um, we can very often extrapolate to when the basin of attraction will vanish 
and spontaneous buckling without poking is induced. So, okay. so in principle, you're right. Yeah, so is there some kind of a mathematical, of course, I think mathematically it's very difficult to show, but is there some mathematical proof that you're going to that limit of no poking and actually to the actual buckling state? And what if, for example, instead of only compressive load in actual structures, you might have some internal pressure or a little bit of torsion? Would, would the whole process still require like a, a sim, single poking would do the job? I or? don't, I, look, look, I don't know. I can only I mean, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, because it's a very uh, a big question, of course, but I'm just trying to understand to- No, 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 um, I, I think there are two- The generality- things. Sure, the, there are two, no. things that, the two things to say about this. One is, um, we are really using the poker essentially as a detector. So we are not kind of inducing, I mean, in the end, you want to do the poking without inducing buckling by poking. We are just using the poker in order to find out um, where the force goes to zero to find out where we would um, induce the poking. And then we are trying to extrapolate to the point where we are buckling without the poker. So the poker in some sense is just kind of sort of, <laughs> it's a probe, you know, I mean, think of it as a, Think of it as a, as, a, as a microscope, a mechanical microscope, which for some reason gives us a lot of information about the stability of the shell. So we are trying to understand the buckling of a shell without the poker um, by using the poker um, to measure a basin of attraction and extrapolating to where the basin of attraction shrinks. That's statement number one. Statement number two, uh, in principle, we have to look at all sorts of imperfections in loading conditions. Um, but I'm very hopeful because you might have realized that um, this is, this, uh, the shells that we are using are not high-tech shells. The data comes from Coke cans. You know, the data comes from Coke cans, um, which of course are not perfect cylinders. The loading conditions will not be perfect on the top and on the bottom. But the phenomenology is so robust that we observe it in Coke cans. So, um, all I can say uh, right now is, uh, it's, I personally believe um, that uh, poking, single point poking, maybe multiple point poking um, could be an extremely, extremely uh, useful general method um, uh, that we have here. Why this is the case, I have no idea. But um, simply the fact that we observe this in Coke cans um, uh, makes me very hopeful. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot. I'm going to stop here. Of course, I have many more questions, but I think I'm going to catch to buy somewhere else to ask. Them. Yes. Okay. Please. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. So we have that's that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Uh, I am sure.